Have a vision. Think big. Ignore the naysayers. Work your ass off and give back and change the world. Because if not us, who? If not now, when? What is the secret to success? And the long version is that I actually always had five rules. And everything that I did, I always used those five rules. And those five rules helped me to become successful in various different areas. And I think, I believe that those rules can be applied to almost anyone and everyone. You don't need to be a bodybuilding champion. You don't need to want to be a governor of California or to be an action hero or anything like that. If you want to excel in whatever you do, those rules are for you. It's that simple. Now I have to tell you right off the top that I always was very intense. As a kid already, I was very intense and I was very hungry. I always wanted to be the best. I always wanted to be number one. I always wanted to get to the top. I never believed in just getting by. Now I have nothing against people that just want to get by because I think there are many roads to happiness but I think that we all here like to be successful and we are driven. So that's why those rules apply to you. So my first rule is find your vision and follow it. You see, I think it's the most important thing that we have a very clear vision of where we go. A goal, where, where do we go? Because you can have the best ship in the world. You can have the best cruise liner, but if the captain does not know where to go, that ship will drift around the world and out there at sea and will never end up anywhere. And this is exactly the way it is in real life. If you don't have a goal, if you don't have a vision, you just drift around and you're not going to be happy. This is why it is so important to have that vision. Now, I created that vision in Austria because I grew up after the Second World War. Austria, right along with Germany, lost the Second World War. Thank God. Uh, and the problem was that everyone was so depressed because they lost the war that there was alcoholism everywhere. There was, of course, depression. There was a terrible economic situation. There was famine. There was starvation and all of those things. And also it was kind of a little place and narrow. I felt kind of, I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to escape. And I couldn't see myself really to work there and to stay there, to work in a factory or to work on a farm or to even to follow my father's footsteps and to become a police officer. I couldn't see that either. As a matter of fact, that's what my, my parents wanted me to do. They wanted me to become a police officer and to marry a girl by the name of Heidi and to have a bunch of children and to run around like the Von Trapp family in The Sound of Music. But that's not what I saw. This was the vision of my parents, but not mine. And luckily, one day in school, I watched a documentary about America. And I found myself. I knew exactly that is where I wanted to end up. I wanted to be in America. Everything that I saw in the documentary, I just loved. Everything was so big. I remember the tall skyscrapers, the monstrous bridges, the giant freeways filled with beautiful cars, the huge jetliners, movie stars, Muscle Beach, and all of those things. I could not wait to get there. The question was just, how do I get there? How do I get to America? I mean, this was not a common thing to do way back in the 50s. No one had the money to travel or anything. But one day, I was fortunate enough to see a magazine and that magazine showed me the path to America and it was a bodybuilding magazine and on the cover was this very muscular guy that was standing there like Hercules with a Hercules outfit his name was Reg Park this Reg Park was on that cover and I remember the cover said Mr. Universe becomes Hercules star I read the article as fast as I could learning about how he grew up in Leeds in England poor and how he trained five hours a day, every single day, and trained and trained and trained and lifted weights, and then he finally became Mr. Great Britain. And then he became Mr. Universe. And then he won a second Mr. Universe title, and a third Mr. Universe title, and then all of a sudden he landed in Rome in Chinichita doing Hercules movies. And there he made millions of dollars, and this, this money he took, and bought himself a gymnasium chain in South Africa and he became a successful gymnasium owner. And as I read, I became more and more certain about my own future. As I read this story, I was so excited, so interested. I knew exactly that I wanted to become another Reg Park. I know 
he laid out the blueprint for my life basically I could see myself I could visualize myself clearly to be a champion on that same stage where he won the Mr. Universe and then to move to America then get into movies and then become rich and famous I had that vision very clearly laid out I was so happy that I knew exactly where I was going from that moment on everything that I did no matter how hard I had to work or how much I had to struggle it didn't matter it was a wonderful joy ride because I knew what the purpose was and I found my passion the simple truth is if you don't have a vision if you don't have a goal if you don't see your future laid out in front of you you're just floating around without a purpose and I think that the numbers speak for themselves this is why so many people around the world are unhappy with their jobs I mean in America 74% of the people hate their job and would like to change jobs but think about that that means that only a quarter of the Americans love their life's work I mean that is a very depressing statistic I always smiled when I worked no matter how hard I worked I always had a great time no matter what I did it didn't matter if it was in bodybuilding or if it was in the movies or if it was as governor I remember in the pumping iron days people ask me in the gym all the time why are you smiling all the time why are you so happy you have to lift 50 tons of weights you have to train five hours a day I mean I look at the other bodybuilders faces and lifters faces and they look kind of depressing they look sour they're miserable that they have to lift weights you you don't look miserable you look happy and I tell them always I say I smile because I know exactly that every rep that I do that every set that I do, every weight that I lift, I get one step closer to turning that vision of mine into reality and becoming that Mr. Universe. I could not wait to lift another 500 pounds in the squats. I could not wait to do another thousand sit-ups. I could not wait to do bench press, more bench press and more curls until I couldn't move my arms anymore. Because I knew that every rep got me closer to standing on that stage as a champion. As a matter of fact, when I lifted weights, I didn't really feel like I was lifting weights. I felt like I was lifting a trophy over my head each time I lifted. And to have all those bodybuilders around me and thousands of people screaming. And I tell you that this vision didn't just help me in bodybuilding, it helped me with everything, like I said. I remember in the movie business, there was many times stunts that I had to do. I got hurt, I was in pain, in agony, and had to do it over and over again. I remember one incident specifically on Conan the Barbarian. There, there I was crawling on all four, on rocks, over rocks and gravel, holding my sword right in front of me. And as I was crawling, the camera followed me, and it was around 30 feet. They, they, they crawl on those rocks and this gravel and eventually after 10 takes my elbows my knees started bleeding and hurting and the director came to me sheepishly and said to me he says do you mind if we do another take I need a close-up of you and I said to him no I don't mind at all I said go and do as many takes as you want he says no 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 I don't want to do that because I know you're in pain you're bleeding I said no 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 I don't feel any pain I said the only thing I see is, is the finished scene I see the finished scene of me crawling on all four with my sword in the front, crawling up and sneaking up behind Thalsa Doom, the main villain of the Conan movie that killed my parents, and rising up behind him and cutting his head off. That's what I see. Remember, crush your enemies, see them driven before you and hear the lamentation of their women. So this is why, because I visualized that scene, this is why I did not feel that pain. I did not care if I was bleeding on my knees, because I know that pain is temporary, but the film is permanent. And I explained that to the director, so this is why I try to tell you, always discover your vision, and the rest will follow. Now my second my second rule is never ever think small. If you're going to accomplish anything, you have to think big. You have to go and shoot for the stars. 
The biggest challenge most people have is because they think small. And the reason why people think small and why they choose small little goals is because they're afraid to fail. They know that if you shoot for a big goal, then the chances of failing are very high. And they're afraid of failing. It's one of the most common things why people are frozen and why they can't make a move in life because they're scared of failing. I say to myself, hey, I'm not worried about failing because that's part of life. You're not going to be go and win everything. And how far can you fall? Look at this. This is the ground. That's as far as I can fall. And you know something? That the only time you really consider the failure is if you fall and you don't get up. But if you get up, you never consider the failure. So I never considered myself a failure. I always considered myself a winner, even though I fell every so often. But I always got up and I always moved forward. This is the important thing. I never had any patience, of course, for sm thinking small, because in German we have a saying, wenn schon, denn schon. And that means that if you do something, then go all out and do it well. And this was not just the case in bodybuilding. I didn't just want to be a bodybuilding champion. I wanted to be the greatest bodybuilder of all times. I wanted to have the most muscle, the, the most muscle of all times, the most definition. I wanted to win the most trophies, the most world championship titles. I just wanted to be the best. And the same is also in movies. I didn't just think about being in movies. No, I wanted to be a movie star. I wanted to have above the title building. I wanted to become the highest paid entertainer. I basically wanted to be another John Wayne. What's wrong with that? And then the same is in politics. I didn't just want to go and uh, be in politics and enter a race for city council. I mean, uh, let's be honest, does that sound right, Schwarzenegger, city council? No, come on. <laughs> not even Schwarzenegger and mayor, no. It had to be Schwarzenegger running for governor, but not just uh, any governor, but governor of the greatest state in the United States, of California. That was the important thing. I give you an example of big, uh, thinking big. When I became governor, I wanted to rebuild California's ancient infrastructure. You see, America has been living off infrastructure that was built in the 50s and 60s. And it drives me absolutely insane that America hasn't started rebuilding that infrastructure. I mean, we haven't uh, invested in new roads or in new transit or in schools or in energy or anything like that for decades. The number of cars that we have now in America are four times as many as we had in the 60s. So therefore, we should be having four times as many freeways, four times as many tunnels, four times as many bridges and all this. But we don't. So this is why I wanted to get our act together and do the upgrading least in California. So when I talk about infrastructure, I didn't really want to just fix roads and fix and close some holes in the roads. I wanted to build massive freeways on top of freeways. I wanted to build the first high-speed rail in the United States. I wanted to build more bridges and more tunnels, more on-ramps and off-ramps. I wanted to see literally cranes everywhere. Well, there was no excuse for Californians to get stuck in traffic, and there was no excuse really to send your kids in overcrowded classrooms and schools, and there was also no excuse that Los Angeles has a hundred-year-old sewage system. That's shitty, I think. <laughs> At first, of course, some of the legislators looked at me like I was absolutely insane when I told them this vision. They were willing to spend maybe $5 billion, which of course is petty cash in compared to what my vision was. But so some politicians, of course, had a hard time to see the big picture because they didn't really ever travel outside California. So they haven't really seen big infrastructure. They haven't really seen big infrastructure all over the United States or maybe in Asia, in China, or in Korea, or in Brazil, or in European countries, or here in Australia, maybe. So they haven't seen that. And then, of course, there are other politicians that simply don't have a vision of the future past the next election, which is a common problem politicians have all over the world. So it, is, it was my job as governor to motivate them and to take them and to see the traffic jams in Los Angeles and to see the overcrowded classrooms and to see all the problems that we have that kept pushing and pushing and I pumped them up enough that eventually they saw the big picture. And eventually, Democrats and Republicans came together and we invested $60 billion to rebuild California's infrastructure, the biggest investment of our state in 50 years. 
So that's what we did because we had a big vision and everyone bought in on this big vision. So remember, never think small, think big. My third rule is ignore the naysayers. I think it is natural that when you have a big vision and big dreams and you have big goals that people are going to say around you, I don't think it can be done. I think it's impossible or no. I tell you, I heard this all the time, but I want to tell you, don't ever let them stop you from dreaming and from shooting for the big goal. Because eliminate just simply those words, no, impossible, and it can't be done. I mean, in each one of my careers, when someone said it's impossible, I heard it's possible. When someone said it can't be done, I heard it can be done. And when someone said no, then I heard loud and clear, yes. So this is what I believed in. I am a big believer of what Nelson Mandela said. He said it always seems to be impossible and still someone does it. And that's exactly what it is. And I wanted to be that one that does it. I wanted to break the new records and I wanted to do something that no one else has ever done. So I think that's what you need to do. Don't ever be worried about that someone hasn't done it. Just think about how many times my career would have stopped. My career would have ended if I would have listened to the naysayers. I mean, it started right away when I was 15 years old and I became a bodybuilder. Right after that happened, I said, I want to be a world champion in bodybuilding. I want to be Mr. Universe. They immediately said, are you crazy? You're in Austria. In Austria, you can become a ski champion or a bicycle champion or something like that. But bodybuilding is an American sport. Forget about it. It's nuts. Then when they wanted to move to America, they said, again, it's impossible. You will never be able to do that. You have no money. You're all by yourself. And then when I wanted to go into show business, after I won 13 world championship titles in bodybuilding, I said, I want to be like Reg Park. I want to be a Hercules. I want to get into movies. Well, I tell you, when I met those agents and managers and studio executives, their reaction was, <laughs> Oh, Arnold, that is so funny. <laughs> you want to be what? A leading man? Oh, come on. I mean, look, uh, uh, first of all, let's start with your body. Look at your body. I mean, you're overdeveloped. You're gigantic. You're like a monster. Are you kidding me? Do you know what the new thing, the new trend is? It's little guys like Dustin Hoffman, Al Pacino, Woody Allen. Those are the new sex symbols. Don't you get it? And then your accent, oh, it gives me the chills just listening to your German bullshit. Come on now. I mean, oh, God. I mean, it's like it's scary when you talk. It's unbelievable. I mean, have you ever, Arnold, I mean, this year, have you ever seen an international movie star with a German accent? It doesn't happen. Forget about that. And then your name, what is it, Schwarzen, Schnitzel or something like that? Yeah, I can see that name already up there on the billboard. Yes, and people are going to storm the theater and the movie houses because Schwarzen Schnitzel is starring in the movie. Oh yeah, I can see that already. So that's what they said. They said to me, he says, look, forget about it. You're a nice guy. I mean, you're a bodybuilding champion. Why don't you, you open up your a gymnasium or a health food store or something like that? We can help you with that. And then we get you on the side some little parts, like maybe playing a bouncer. I mean, with your body, perfect. Or maybe a wrestler. Oh, oh, oh I, I have a good idea with your accent, a Nazi officer. Now, that's really great for you. I call my buddies over at Hogan's Heroes. I mean, they would probably use someone like you. So that's what they said. Imagine that. Everywhere I turned, they said, no, it won't happen. It's not going to happen and forget about it. Luckily, I did not listen. I did not listen because I knew if I worked hard enough and if I worked as hard as I did in bodybuilding, five, six hours a day, that I would make it, that I could prove them wrong. And I started working very hard. I started taking acting classes, English classes, speech classes, dialogue classes, even accent removal classes. <laughs> I ran around all day saying lines like, a fine wine grows on a vine. Because you see, we Austrians and Germans have a difficult time with the V and with the W and with the F, we get it all mixed up. So it was a fine wine grows on a vine. Or the sink is made out of zinc. And all those kind of lines. I said, oh, and oh, and you know something? All of a sudden, I got a little break. In the early 70s, I remember 
all of a sudden I got a TV show, a little part, then another little part, and then all of a sudden I got a phone call from Lucille Ball to be in her special happy anniversary and goodbye, uh, which was with Art Carney. I had the six minute scene as an Italian masseur. Now most people don't know the difference between an Italian accent and the German accent, so I got away with my German accent. But I played this Italian monsieur and I was so delighted. And then right after that I got a guest starring role in Streets of San Francisco with Michael Douglas and Carl Morton. And then Pumping On and Stay Hungry. And then of course I landed the big role of Conan the Barbarian. So finally I got the big, big break. And you know what was so interesting about it was that as soon as we were finished with the Conan movie, we were out there on a promotion tour. And the director said at the press conference, the director is John Milius. He said, if we wouldn't have had Schwarzenegger with those muscles, we would have had to build one. Now think about that. Before it was this huge obstacle to have this body, and all of a sudden the director says, if we wouldn't have had Schwarzenegger with his body, we would have had to build one. Now what a turnaround. And then when I did Terminator, James Cameron said, which was really great. He said the I'll be back line became one of the most famous movie lines in history because of Arnold's crazy accent because he sounded like a machine when he talks. So as you see, everything that the naysayers said was a liability became an asset. And the same was also in my political career. When I ran for governor, they immediately said, I shouldn't do it, it is a big mistake, it won't happen, I will lose, and all of those kind of things, and the rest, of course, is history. The bottom line is, if I would have uh, listened to the naysayers, my career would have ended when I was 15 years old. I would be still yodeling in Austria, in the Alps, and I would not be talking here today to you. And the reason why I'm here today and talking to you is, is because I did not listen to you can't, or it's impossible, or no. So I just recommend to you very strongly, Ignore the naysayers. My fourth rule is work your ass off. Nobody ever stumbled upon success by accident, except maybe the guy who found gold in uh, California. But don't ever think that you can be that guy. I mean, you never want to fail because you didn't work hard enough. I always believed no stone unturned. Work your butt off. That's what I always believed. No matter what you do, work, work, work. I remember Muhammad Ali, one of my great heroes, had a great line in the 70s when he, when he was asked, how many sit-ups do you do? He said, I don't know, because I start counting only when it starts burning. When it starts burning, that's when he starts counting. You see, that's what makes you a champion. It doesn't matter in what area you're in. No pain, no gain. The bottom line is, one of my rules, which is work your butt off, if you don't apply that rule, all the other rules won't mean anything. I mean, it drives me absolutely nuts when people say, I don't have time to work out. Have you heard that many times? I don't have time to work out, or I have worked so hard all day, I'm tired, I cannot work out anymore, or I cannot read another book, or I cannot improve myself, or I don't have time, or I work so hard that I cannot really improve my business, or I cannot grow as a person, or any of those things. What the hell are we talking about here? I mean, the day is 24 hours, you sleep 6 hours, so you have 18 hours left. I mean, I know there's some of you out there that say, well, wait a minute, I sleep actually eight hours, but let's just sleep faster, okay? You didn't... I mean, let's not get bugged down with this stuff here. Listen, when I came to the United States, I remember that I trained five hours a day, every day, and I was managing a construction business, and I was a bricklayer, and I went to college also, and I took acting classes from... 8 o'clock at night to 12 o'clock midnight. All of that in one day. Every day I did that. I did not worry about it. I knew that I had 24 hours and I didn't want to waste one single hour. Because I believe of what Ted Turner said, who is one of the great entrepreneurs who started CNN and so on. He said, early to bed, early to rise. Work like hell and advertise. So that's what I believe. 
Just remember, you can't climb that ladder of success with your hands in your pockets. You must work your ass off. It's that simple. And my fifth and last rule is, don't just take. Give something back. Leave your mark on the world. I believe that we all have an obligation to do something for our community, something for our state, something for our country. We must serve a cause that is greater than ourselves. Because we all know that on the end we will be judged not by how much we made, but by how much we give. Ever since America greeted me with open arms, I've had this sense of responsibility and I felt obligated to give something back to America. Because I know that everything that I have accomplished is because of America. If it's my bodybuilding career, if it is my show business career, my political career, the money that I've made, my great family that I have, all of this is because of America. But I have to recognize the fact that America did not become the land of opportunity in this great country by itself. No, in history, people worked tirelessly in America. People fought and people died to make it the land of freedom and opportunity and the land of liberty. So now it is our responsibility, if we want to keep it the number one country in the world, to work for that and to give something back to that country. And it doesn't matter if you're in America or if you're in Australia or if you're in China or if you're in Japan or in Italy. It is the same thing. You all have to give something back to your country, no matter where you're from. Now, I love the words of my father-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, who started the Peace Corps, the Job Corps, legal aid to the poor during the Kennedy and during the Johnson administration. He was uh, the number one public servant, and he always inspired me to become a public servant. He was one of my heroes. He said at Yale University at a commencement speech, he said to the students, tear down that mirror. Tear down that mirror that makes you always look at yourself. And you will be able to look beyond that mirror, and you will see the millions and millions of people that need your help. And I saw those millions and millions of people and this is why I tried to take every opportunity that I could to give something back. I started training Special Olympians, people that were intellectually handicapped, to help them with weightlifting and powerlifting. I became the international powerlifting coach and the, the torchbearer for Special Olympics. Then later on, I joined the Simon Wiesenthal Center to fight prejudice, so we don't have the things happening again uh, as we had during the Second World War, during the Nazi Reich. And I joined also the President's Council on Fitness. I became the chairman under President Bush from 1990 to 1993 uh, to be the chairman and to promote health and fitness in all 50 states. I traveled all 50 states. I started after-school programs for the most vulnerable children, for inner-city children to make them be able to say no to drugs, no to gangs, and no to violence, and to say yes to education and yes to life. And I, every single time I reached out and I gave something back, I felt fantastic. Nothing made me happier. I would rather play chess with an eight-year-old kid in an after-school program or play golf, a round of golf with a special Olympian than go down another red carpet of a movie premiere. And I have nothing against movies, but to give something back to me is more important than just to think about myself. Eventually, the joy of giving back was so great that I decided to become a public servant full-time and to turn my back, actually walk away from my career as an actor. After I finished promoting Terminator 3, I jumped into the race, into the governor's race in California, and I ran for governor. And even though my friends advised me not to do that, they said, are you crazy, Arnold? Don't you understand that you would lose now this 20, 30 million dollars a movie that you're getting paid? And they will only pay you $178,000 as governor a year? Well, I didn't care. Because I knew that all the money that I've made and to be in that position in the first place to make this money is because of America. It was time to give something back. So I became governor and I didn't even take the $178,000, I gave it back to the taxpayers because it was petty cash, it's the last thing I needed. And I can tell you that those seven years 
were the most exciting and the most rewarding and the most gratifying years of my life. To work all day long to solve problems and to serve the people was absolutely heaven. It was the best job I've ever had. But I also knew that eventually it's going to come to an end. And after two terms, it did come to an end. But when it came to an end, the one thing that didn't come to an end and was not finished was my desire to be a public servant and to serve the people. And this is why I continued to work for Special Olympics. That's why I continued to work on fighting my fitness crusade and traveling around the world to promote health and fitness. And this is why I continued to support after-school programs. And we even started the Schwarzenegger Institute at the University of Southern California to continue to inspire students and leaders around the world to find solutions to complicated issues and to give back and to make the world a better place. So because, thank you. But I tell you that I was very fortunate that I had great heroes. I had great heroes that I could look up to. And I mentioned two of them, Muhammad Ali and Sergeant Shrava, my father-in-law. But there's other great heroes like Gorbachev, Reagan, Mandela, great leaders like Mother Teresa, Chancellor Cole, and Churchill, and the list goes on and on. I mean, those people had such an impact on the world. Single-handedly, they've changed the world. I mean, if you think about just Gorbachev, I mean, this man, every time I meet him, I'm in awe. I mean, he grew up under communism, and he rose from the bottom of the ranks straight up to the top. He became president of the Soviet Union, one of the most powerful people in the world. And he was the leader of the Communist Party. And when he was in the top position, he realized that the system was broken. Now what do you do when you are the top leader of the Communist Party and you realize that the system, that communism doesn't work? Well, you know what he did? He dismantled communism. Think about the courage that that takes. I mean, the guts that it takes to do that. Think about that Gorbachev completely transformed his country with glasnost to give his people for the first time freedom. And then through perestroika, by reforming Russia's economy. He didn't wait for the next president. He didn't complain. He simply said, if not me, who? And if not now, when? So I feel very strongly all of us need to have...